of February 2010. We had a hell of a wild ride this week, so let's go ahead and take a look at the chart first of the S&P 500. And you can see we had a, a, a nice turnaround here late in the day with some big volume as well. So the market is, uh, you know, volatile, obviously. We, uh, let's take a look at the weekly time frame just to frame this whole week um, and, and just the recent activity. As we know, you know, from the 2007 high to the 2009 low, we got up towards that 50% retracement late last year, kind of fumbled around in there a little bit. And the first week of this year was really pretty easy on the long side. A lot of those little junk stocks were moving big time. And uh, it just seemed real easy. And I was you know, pointing that out back in January that it seemed a little bit too easy to be making money on the long side um, during that first week of the year. And uh, today, uh, you know, just about down in here, I was saying it's seeming a little bit too easy to be making money on the, on the short side as well. I was not calling for a bounce. I made that clear. Um, I was just saying that uh, you know basically you have to manage your emotions. That if you're you know if you're making a lot of money on the short side and it's getting real easy, that's when you have to kind of look over your shoulder and say, hey, well now's maybe the time to be real careful about protecting those gains. Um, today I'd said right at about this point I was also just covered all my short positions. I just covered uh, sold my SRS. Um, and, you know, really wasn't believing that we were going to see a big rally here, so I didn't get, uh, uh, I, I didn't get involved in the long side until later on, but uh, certainly wasn't expecting a rally of that magnitude. The reason I was covering the shorts, first of all, was we came down to the daily S2, and then we tagged just below that on lighter volume. And that lighter volume, a lot of times that's what you see in the S&P 500 that... Uh, you come down to a key level that a lot of people are watching, like the S2, that's the uh, you know, for, you know, pivot analysis. Comes down to that daily S2, uh, bounces a little bit, and then undercuts it, and really just gets that last little shakeout. The lighter volume in there indicated that there wasn't as much fear at that point, and it was basically just probably catching uh, the, the, uh, the stops from the early... Uh, from the people who got long right in here thinking that that pivot would hold as support. Again, those pivot levels are like moving averages, they're like trend lines, they're like VWAP, they're like any technical tool. They're good for you know visual reference points, something to compare price to, uh, and a reason to look closer at the action. They're not necessarily a reason to make purchases. The people who made that pur you know initial purchase uh, right there at the uh, S2 level, um, you know, likely spit them out right here, but then when the market bounced up above there, this little resistance, you know, in very short-term analysis, obviously, but if you're a day trader, that's what you have to look at. But that near-term uh, uh, resistance became support, and then the market really got some volume as it pushed up through the daily VWAP. Here late in the day, I was uh, commenting that it was, you know, kind of stalling out at the two-day volume weighted average price. And I think the last time I had mentioned, uh, you know, the two-day volume weighted average price, somebody said, well, you know, how do you know when to look at the two-day versus the one-day? Well, you know, once the one-day volume weighted, or the volume weighted average price for the day uh, no longer kind of holds its relevance as far as, you know, resistance, then you want to start to back it up and say, well, what else is relevant? Uh, yesterday we had a big down day, so what's the average price since yesterday, the two-day volume weighted average price? And that's when you start to look at that. If it gets up through that level, I was thinking uh, that, you know, it was, it was kind of looking like maybe we were even going to make a push all the way up to the daily uh, uh, pivot. Obviously, it didn't do that. But the market did uh, finish with a 22 cent gain for the day. For the week, obviously, uh, it was a little bit more difficult. Here's the five days of trading for the S&P 500. We had, uh, you know, some strength Monday and Tuesday, kind of. Uh, sideways below that five or above the five day moving average actually on uh, uh, on uh, Wednesday and then yesterday of course we gapped lower got creamed and then this morning uh, a little bit low, lower lows and a very impressive volume here today uh, as the market seemed to stabilize so this type of volume is, is you know especially when you have this type of candle I think they call it a doji or whatever that you want to call it but the point is Forget about what it looks like at the end of the day because well, don't forget about it. But I mean, you can't wait till the end of the day for those candles to form. Obviously, you know the people who were looking at the intraday time frames knew that this market was turning well before you had a uh, end of the day candle to look at. So let's just kind of change the scaling here on this daily time frame and see. You know what I like to do is take a look and and, and just kind of say, well, where did we you know end up finding? 
uh, lows of this move, at least, you know, at least for so far. And, you know, is that a, releva a, a level of relevance on a uh, different time frame? Well, we held above, obviously, that 200-day moving average. Here's that 200-day moving average down here. And, um, you know, that's down at about 102, 102 and a half or so. We could take a look and see. Uh, the exact level is 102.06 right now, and it's obviously rising, so uh, that level changes as far as, you know, where it's going to be located and that sort of thing. Uh, but, you know, the daily picture, it, it seems as though we got sold off pretty hard this week, and, um, you know, we've still, we, we're, we're still not intermediate term bullish, but definitely uh, I think we could, we could continue to bounce a little bit in here. And uh, then we want to see how the market handles a bounce from this level, whether we can uh, look at it and say it looks like it's going to be able to, to you know, to recover, but, uh, you know, recover fully and, and get back, you know, and push up through those new highs. Right now it doesn't seem uh, likely, but, uh, you know, earlier in the week I had posted a, uh, a little picture of some gymnasts laying over the, the, uh, the little, uh, or ballerinas, I guess, laying over their rail and saying that in this market you really have to be uh, flexible and, and certainly you know even on an intraday basis obviously you had to, to, to show a lot of flexibility in your opinion of, of what the market was going to do here um, so we had again big volume kind of stamping uh, the, the end it looks like of this short-term sell-off it just kind of puts the exclamation point at the end of it it doesn't mean we're, we're guaranteed to recover or that we're gonna just you know shoot higher from here obviously but uh, you look at the you know look at this 30 minute time frame we're still below a declining five-day moving average and this is just considered a bounce within this intermediate term downtrend but when we look at other pieces of the puzzle such as this big volume that it came on it says that it's likely that uh, we will get some further turnaround so Maybe early next week we could get a little bit of a pullback, maybe down just below 106, and then continue to bounce higher. Um, we're going to obviously have these prior levels of support, which will have the potential to offer resistance out uh, as this market uh, does attempt to recover further. So, you know, perhaps we get a, a, a stair step higher from here rather than just a, a straight V, which would be ideal, uh, you know, for trading. Uh, these these runaway moves are more difficult, but because uh, um, they don't let you in basically. But if we get you know maybe a pullback down towards you know one hundred six fifty or so, and then begin to rally, uh, encounter a little bit of resistance at these prior support levels, and then we get that five day moving average kind of flattening out, that could pave the way for a little bit further recovery here on the daily time frame. That, Maybe we get you know a run up and test that 50-day moving average. Well, here on the daily time frame, we've got a declining 10, 20, and 50-day moving average. So it, it says this market is damaged, and that we have to take you know the the downside uh, potential still very seriously. So unfortunately, for those looking for just the uh, you know the easy answer, there is no easy answer here other than you've got to remain flexible and uh, be willing to, to change your opinion quickly. Um, let's take a look at the NASDAQ. The NASDAQ, as we know, uh, really was the weaker uh, market. We had uh, seen resistance forming at that 44 level, uh, which was also the location of the declining 10-day moving average this week. Um, and, or, or, I'm sorry, on, on Wednesday. Uh, anyways, we, we, you know, we had seen, we've seen this market stair-stepping lower, where prior levels of support in that general area are acting as resistance. So this is just the classic, you know, support becoming resistance. And now we've got, you know, big volume stamp in here as well. So we had seen um, on these, you know, what, you know, the pattern this year basically has been, we've been getting the big volume days as the market declines. Now these big volume days were indicating that there was a lot of fear and it's, it's most noticeable obviously in the NASDAQ. Okay, so we had seen these big red candles coming on, uh, on, on, on heavy volume, indicating people were just, you know, kind of throwing their stocks away. They wanted out quick. And the subsequent, um, let's just say, take a look in here, the subsequent rallies in here were coming on light volume up to prior levels of support. And, you know, first this 50-day moving average, and then this prior level of, you know, traditional support, saying that you really want to be careful in those areas and you want to be looking for the potential that the market will weaken and decline. Well, because prior support 
tends to act as resistance. And it, it doesn't happen nice and neat and simple like this all the time, but sometimes it does, obviously. Uh, we had that gap lower Thursday, continued to sell off, and then today, real nice, uh, you know, continued um, uh, buying into the close. Uh, after that, uh, you know, after, after kind of the same, you know, a little bit different look in here, but we didn't get down as far relatively, that is, down to the, to the uh, daily S2, um, like we'd seen in the NASDAQ. But, you know, the market remains damaged. This, this $44 level is going to continue to be important next week. And we're gonna, you know, we're gonna be looking for any rallies to, to maybe chop up near there. And you know, you can always make a case for the potential of an inverted head and shoulders pattern. In other words, maybe we're gonna see this that, that we've got a left shoulder here developing, or that's that's been carved out, uh, and then you can call this a head. Now, if we kind of rally up towards there, middle of next week, then we pull back. Uh, I can't draw over there. Pull back find support at the rising five-day moving average, and then build the energy to break out, that's a potential scenario. Obviously, there's a lot of moving pieces here uh, that, that, that has to occur. And then we have you know, the breaking of, of you know, what's the most relevant trend line in here recently. Probably not off these highs right here, but what really represents the essence of trend is probably uh, this level here. And that's you know, going to be approximately where we find that five-day moving average as well. Uh, by the way, if you're on Twitter and you're, you're watching, watching me live, uh, once I've gone through the indices, I'm going to uh, take a look at a couple of stocks that you guys are interested in. And, you know, we'll see just one each, please, and, and we'll see if we can get through a few of those. But, then, you know, the NASDAQ remains wounded here, basically. We've got, we've got some, some, some deep cuts. It uh, doesn't mean it can't recover, but the patient is, is in critical care here right now and um, is, is going to need to be monitored, uh, you know, um, closely uh, for signs that if it, get, you know, it gets uh, weak again. But right now, you know, again, still some mixed messages there. The, the, the Russell 2000 is, uh, you know, same thing, big volume, kind of stamp towards the end of this move. Although we've got, you know, we had the 50-day moving, 10 and 20, uh, I'm sorry, the conjunction of the 10 and 50-day moving averages uh, acting as resistance here uh, middle of the week, and now we're below those, they're declining. So, uh, wounded picture, but uh, you know, we'll, we'll be looking for maybe about $60.25 to uh, $60, 60 and a half, 60.25 to 60 and a half um, is looking like the biggest level of potential resistance for this market. Uh, that is the Russell um, going into next week. Um, the semiconductors have been, you know, as of yesterday, they were down about 12, you know, almost 13 percent. And this is the group that we've been watching as, you know, kind of leading this market lower. So it was good to see, you know, somewhat of a recovery in there today. It's still, I mean, there's nothing bullish about this. Obviously, we've got a declining 10, 20, and 50-day moving average. On the uh, longer term, we, we came down, very, came very close to, you know, within pennies of touching that 200-day moving average. And those moving averages, again, are merely reference points, something to compare price to. But the 200-day moving average will often catch the, the market as it you know, dips down to that level when we've got a primary trend. And we've got this bigger uh, level in here in the semiconductors that indicates that you know, for this sell-off, maybe the biggest damage has been done uh, right now. But it doesn't mean you rush out and buy this because they're still weak looking. I mean, if you want to trade it, you know, with stops below here, then, you know, that's, that's one way of doing it. It's not my preferred way of, of approaching the market, but it's, you know, it's good to see that the volume did come in also to this, um, you know, into the semiconductor group. And, you know, here we're looking at a 65 minute time frame. And uh, some people ask me why 65 minutes, not 60. 65 minutes, you have six six candles or bars that are equal to each other. If you're using a 60-minute time frame and you're moving, using moving averages or any other study, uh, you really ought to switch to a 65 period, uh, that is 65 minutes rather, because that way you have six equal candles uh, of, of 65 minutes each uh, over the course of one day. If you're looking at 60-minute candles, you're looking at seven different candles that create during the, the course of the day. You've got one 30-minute time uh, candle that, that builds from 9.30 to 10 a.m. and then every hour after that. So you're, you're comparing apples and oranges, basically. 
It's a cleaner way to look at it. It's not that, again, that these moving averages are you know, something where you, you, you want to buy at a moving average, but it just kind of keeps it more honest so it lines up with uh, the moving averages and, and what you're looking at on different time frames. So use the 65 minute. Uh, hope I start seeing people tweeting uh, 65 minute charts instead of 60 minute charts because uh, most people still are using 60 minutes. But you know, look at the semiconductors here on this uh, on this uh, trend line as well. A trend line break doesn't mean that it will reverse, but that's one piece of the puzzle. Really, for a bigger bounce to to catch hold in the semiconductors, twenty five dollars and sixty five cents ish area is is where we need to see uh, this this market hold, and then perhaps we get a run up towards that fifty day moving average, or you know, probably the twenty day moving average will will offer resistance next on on a rally. The financials did come down and tag that 200-day uh, moving average as expected. So, you know, they, there's, there's people who are looking at this market, I think, as a short below 1380. And you have to look at, well, what other pieces of the puzzle are there? Where have we come from? Where do we have the potential to go? That is, when we've come from the down, you know, when, we, when we're selling off and we see, you know, a nice measured move like this where we have, you know, two drives lower with that... Uh, um, light volume, uh, and I was, I was saying on Wednesday, this is a classic bear market, you know, what you look for, this is a classic, you can put this in a book, and if anyone's writing a technical analysis book, this is a great example of a bearish flag that occurs, you know, with the declining 10, 20, and 50 day moving average, the market finds resistance right at that 50 day, uh, after a light volume test of it, uh, we had broken down obviously on the gap, but you know, do you sell short? The question becomes, do you sell short on a break below this range that's been, you know, holding this market? Uh, you know, breaking 1380, of course not, because you've got this next, you know, this other important technical piece, which is the 200-day moving average. So people who are so selling their longs or, or starting new shorts in there, I think are going to have a case of seller's remorse. We had some big volume. We were due for a bounce, maybe... Um, up towards you know, that, that uh, 1420 area. Um, but still, I mean, the financials are weak. They're, 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 they're a weak, they're, they're a sick looking group on the daily time frame. On the weekly, they're, you know, they're kind of, they're, they're, they're actually more neutral than anything. You, get, you have these, uh, you know, that 10 and 20 week moving average crossing uh, back and forth in here. It's indicating indecision. Uh, and, you know, getting ready perhaps for a bigger decline. You know, the next couple of weeks will, will really tell us a lot about the longer term, the health of, of the financials. The uh, Russell 2000, or not the Russell, uh, we already spoke about that, but the IYR, I've been talking bearish about this and, and actually was, um, you know, told subscribers uh, in a midday video that basically what we wanted to see in the uh, IYR today, um, I was recording a video here, I said we want to see a rally up there and then short below this level. Um, so, so that was a nice move, and I was suggesting the SRS. So this is basically buying the SRS here, and I had tweeted that I was out of my SRS right at about this level uh, right here. Um, so you know you have to be flexible. There's some good short-term trades. You can get leverage with these uh, um, vehicles such as the SRS or the SDS or the SS, you know, SDS being... Uh, the short uh, for the uh, S and P 500, which was a great trade in the morning, and then the SSO, which was you know a great trade in the afternoon, the double long. So you know flexibility of, of opinion remains important here. Let's go back to that Russ, uh, IYR though. This was you know the second shoe all last year. We kept hearing about that. I think we still get some uh, bounce in here, but but this is a, a damaged uh, group. Here's an, you know it's another group that. It's, it's come down and flirted with the trend line from, from March of last year, and we've got a declining 10, 20, and 50-day moving average. So, you know, this is going to be an important level right up just about, just north of 45, $45.30 or so. Getting back above that, maybe it can recover, but for now, we have these lower highs and lower lows. So this is going to be an important area because it's also where we see, uh, you know, that we find the location of that 50-day moving average as well. So uh, I, I think near term, obviously you don't want to be short these things, especially you know after it rallied like that. Um, but let's take a look at because I've got a request here to take a look at gold and, and GLD. Uh, G, you know, my usual caveat is I suck at trading gold. I'm just you know not very good at it. But uh, 
you know, you take a look at gold. Gold seems to to be undergoing some, you know, on the daily time frame. We've got this pattern still of lower highs and lower lows. Here's an important level right near about 105 and a half or so prior resistance here that had been tested as support twice. And we had, you know, what did we have? We had lower highs coming down to that level. So, so sellers were getting more aggressive price-wise, and they were getting more aggressive time-wise. Uh, if we back it out to a weekly time frame and just kind of tighten this up a little bit, we're still in an uptrend overall, but uh, we've got this longer-term trend line that's, that's also being flirted with here from the uh, uh, late, you know, uh, what is this, Dece uh, November of uh, 2008. So we're holding that trend line for now, and I'd say it's probably maybe becoming a little bit more neutral. It'd be nice to see gold recover back above 105 and a half, 106. That would make it kind of, uh, I think, be a little bit more neutral in here from a uh, daily time frame. But you've got a declining 10, 20, and 50 day moving average that says you don't want to be buying it yet. Wait for it to stabilize a little bit more in this area and see if we're going to be able to maintain this longer term uptrend uh, or whether this is a bigger problem developing for gold that might reverse the weekly time frame. So, uh, you know, the, the jury, I guess, is still out on gold. And, um,